few people logging on. Ms. Pearson, it seems to be an odd background noise. Do you have that on your end? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, good evening, everyone. We still have a few folks logging in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, my name is Christy Somerville Majet, Division Superintendent. Uh, we just like to say welcome to the parents and guardians um, that are joining us on the call this evening. Uh, we had an opportunity to have the call early, one, the same call earlier this morning at 11 uh, for parents and guardians that were available during the day. Um, as always, I did notice we have a few faculty and staff that are on the call. Um, as always, you're welcome, but if you're looking for faculty staff matters only, um, then tomorrow evening at six, we will have a separate call that's for faculty and staff. Um, so if you are <clears throat> joining the call tonight, um, again, just thank you. We appreciate this opportunity to share um, just some proposed plans with you all. Uh, you'll hear tonight um, from the team and I'm gonna introduce who is on the call. Um, for the panelists, you have Mrs. Tracy Rogers, Assistant Superintendent, Ms. Tiffany Brown, Director of Personnel, Ms. Mrs. Crystal Pearson, Director of Technology, Mrs. Ms. Leori Mallory, uh, Director of Pupil Personnel, Dr. Terrence White, Principal at Tatera Elementary, um, Mrs. Latanya Hutchison, Principal of Meharan Powelton Elementary, Dr. Mark Harrison, Principal of Red Oak Sturgeon Elementary School, um, Dr. Darnell Carter, Principal of Russell Middle School, and Dr. Ronald Thornhill, Principal of Brunswick High School, all on the call. Um, to give you a little insight as to why we're here uh, at this point, uh, as you know, COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, um, has presented some challenges uh, for us that are, um, definitely need to be addressed in these unprecedented times of how instruction is going to look for us in the fall. Um, so I know that many of you have been following um, the, the governor's updates and his guidance. And a few weeks ago, he was able to put out his guidance as to um, some guidelines that we have to work within with looking at our students returning uh, back to school and in what format that's gonna be. Um, so in looking at this, we had to look at what's gonna be best for the students of Brunswick County Public Schools and, and for our community. Um, so understand as we go through the plan tonight, um, there's a level of fluidity to this. Um, simply because as we get guidance from the Virginia Department of Health, from the Virginia Department of Education, um, as well as following, following the CDC guide, um, guidelines, there may be changes that will come about. So what you're here tonight is just our draft plan for how we look at uh, the reopening of school in the fall uh, with the understanding that we are taking feedback from these parent calls through your questions and comments so that we can continue tweaking and crafting this plan um, and then we will be presenting to our school board on Monday night uh, to seek approval for the plan because we do have to get it to the Department of Education um, and have it posted to get the wheels in motion for what we need to do next. Um, so with that, just thanks again for your engagement, your participation with this tonight. Um, you'll have an opportunity to um, ask some questions at, towards the end, but if you have any questions as we go throughout, um, there are two ways to get questions to us tonight. So if you have a pen ready or a pencil ready, I am going to give you a number to send text messages to. So if you could send a text message to 434-532-5175 and just send your name and your question. And when we get to the question and answer section of um, tonight's presentation, I will uh, make sure I make every effort to read your question and then I will call on my esteemed panelists here uh, to answer uh, the, these questions. Um, again, it's 434-532-5175. And then those of you who are on the computer, it's a little chat feature down below. Just chat us your question. Uh, when we get to uh, that portion of the program this um, afternoon, we will go ahead and make sure that we answer those questions for you. So again, as you go into this, Let's go into this with an open mind and understand that this is fluid. 
It may be subject to change, but we really do need your feedback um, and your questions are good for us. The 11 o'clock group definitely challenged us and they gave us a good workout of questions. Um, so we expect nothing less from this group tonight. So with that, I wanna explain what the structure is going to look like um, throughout this evening. Um, right after I'm done speaking, you'll have Mrs. Rogers, and then right after her, Mrs. Pearson will come up with technology support. And after Mrs. Pearson is Ms. Mallory um, to look at a lot of the, the mitigation strategies and how we're gonna keep the kids safe. And then the operational aspects of what we do is going to be followed up by Ms. Brown. After that, we'll have the Q&A, and then we will um, close things out for us tonight. And then right at the end, Ms. Pearson is going to let us know about the survey that we really need you all to complete um, so that we can get some additional feedback and really fine tune where we are. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Mrs. Pearson to share her screen. And Ms. Rogers is going to start with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Majette. Good evening, everyone. So on the screen, as you can see, we have the Brunswick County Return to School Plan draft. And as Ms. Pearson scrolls down, there will be a table of contents that you will be able to see and click on to go to a specific section in the plan if you only want to look at a specific section. Um, but that will help direct you in finding information. And if you continue to scroll, the first several pages, I included the phased reopening guidance from DOE um, and the governor so that for parents who maybe haven't seen this, you can see the guidance document that we used um, and the guidance that we had to follow as we created our plan as our task force worked on this over a month ago. Um, we didn't have all of this guidance at that time, but as new guidance came out, they came in and they revised and redrafted the plan. So we've been working on this plan for several months looking at this, but you can read through here just to see the guidance that we've been given. We will be going into school in, under phase three unless anything changes between now and the start of school. Uh, we expect to be starting school on August the 10th under phase three. So you can see all of the things that are um, pertain to phase three and then some general information that applies to all of the phases in general, just some things that um, they are requiring or recommending that we do. So as you scroll down again, you can read this um, at your leisure once we share it on our website. The first section for instruction, um, I again want to thank all of those parents who participated several weeks ago in our webinar and then completed the survey thereafter. That data and that um, feedback was critical as we use that to modify what the task force originally worked on. Um, and one of the things that we heard loud and clear was that a lot of our parents did not feel safe sending their students back to school yet. So we are giving parents tonight, when this is all said and done in the survey, you will have the option of choosing either the hybrid model, which involves some face-to-face -face instruction and virtual learning, or you can choose the full virtual learning model, meaning you're still, your child will not have to come to school for face-to-face -face instruction and everything can be done online. So those will be your two options and we're going to go through and describe it tonight so that you can see and then ask questions um, for clarification about what those two look like. So on the screen you'll see the elementary first, the in-person schedule. So when you look at this on Monday at all three elementary schools, early childhood, pre-k, kindergarten, second, and fifth grade students will attend and also at Totero the multiple disability students will attend. On Tuesday the early childhood, pre-K, kindergarten, and second grade will attend. At Red Oak, it's early childhood, kindergarten, and second grade because they do not have a pre-K and the same group at Tatera, the multiple disabilities, early childhood, pre-K, K, and second. Wednesday, early childhood, first, third, and fourth. At Meharan Palton, at Red Oak Sturgeon, early childhood, first, third, and fourth. And again, at Tatera with the addition of the multiple disabilities, early childhood, first, third, and fourth. And then on Thursday, the early childhood first and third at Meharan Palton, at Red Oak, and at Totero. And again, Totero has the multiple disability class. So you can see that the, alter, the multiple disabilities and early childhood group will attend all four days. Pre-K through third will attend two of the days. So um, that's the schedule as it stands now. And Friday we are using for our teachers for both planning, school level, grade level meetings and professional development that they will need to continue to get as we move through this process and um, 
revamp our skills in providing the virtual learning. So that's going to be a critical day that they use for creating videos for the next week's lessons for those students who are participating in virtual, um, but that's going to be critical time. And so the next chart shows the very opposite. If you are not in face-to-face -face instruction, you will be, scroll down, back up just a little bit. I'm sorry, Ms. Pearson. Um, if you're not in the face-to-face, -face, then you will be at home receiving the virtual learning at that time. So it's the exact opposite of the first chart that we went over. Um, but you can see there what students will be at home and receiving the virtual if you choose the hybrid model. And that next chart shows what that schedule looks like for a virtual day starting at 820 um, with breakfast for the students and also office hours for the teachers so that they can um, check in with virtual students online, re responding to any emails or texts from parents who may have questions, but those are their office hours. And then the instruction will start um, at nine o'clock. And we have a remediation block at the end of the day, um, which is gonna be critical for working with students in that loss of instruction from last year and filling in any gaps. And we did put an hour in the middle of the day, especially for our elementary students, for both lunch and recess, because we definitely wanna encourage physical activity for our students even during this. We don't want them sitting in front of a computer all day long. So the next several charts will show you the middle school schedules and their schedules follow basically their same um, schedule that it would be for um, a regular school year under regular circumstances. But what they've chosen to do is send students to school on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays and one third of the grade level will come each day. So on Tuesday, one third of six, one third of seventh, and one third of eighth. Then on Wednesday, a different group, one third, sixth, seventh, and eighth will attend. And on Thursday, the remaining third, sixth, seventh, and eighth will attend. So those will only attend one day each week, and it will be either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And that will be determined based on the bus routes um, picking up from certain areas, similar areas, and bringing them to school. And you can see that the day is from 7.45 to 3.30. Some additional information underneath the charts, again, just to highlight um, what, what we've said as far as Monday will be an all virtual day. So all students will be um, virtual. They will get the introduction of the lessons for the week, the new concepts, new skills. They will give, be given the outline of the assignments for the week and the due dates so that as students rotate in throughout the week, they all, even the students at home, know what assignments they're working on, what they are to do, and we'll have that on Monday um, with that virtual lesson for everyone. So you can go on to the high school. At the high school, the schedule was really complicated with the larger numbers of students being able to try to social distance was going to be very difficult. And because of the maturity level of these students and the majority of them will be able to handle um, virtual instruction, it was determined that the students who will come for face to face will be your multiple disability students, some of your special needs students that will be identified by the teachers, and then students who are signed up for CTE classes like culinary arts, nursing assistant, cosmetology, advanced ag fab class, early childhood, and band students. They will need to come for face-to-face -face instruction. So as a result of needing to come for face-to-face -face for those classes, they will come all day. They will report by between 7.30 and eight o'clock. First block will start at eight. They will report to a classroom where they will participate in their first block class through virtual learning and then second and third block will be their CTE classes. We also decided at the high school level for consistency and so that everyone would get an equitable instructional experience this year, that we are doing all classes as a full year. So the students will be taking all eight courses, all eight classes all year long, but on an A-B schedule. So the A day will be Mondays and Thursdays and the B day will be Tuesdays and Fridays. The high school chose to have a day in the middle for their work day for the teachers, again, for um, professional development, building level meetings, working on videos and lesson plans um, to provide to the students for the virtual instruction. Okay, and then the virtual only. So if you choose to be virtual only, this is what your schedule will look like each day. At the elementary level, again, starting at 8.20 to nine will be breakfast and office hours and then the instruction starting at nine and going through the day with the remediation block at the end. At the middle school for the virtual days, again, following that same basic timeline, block one for sixth grade is electives, then they go into their core instruction. 
it gives you the timeline for each class. And if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the only difference between sixth, seventh and eighth grade is the time for their electives. Um, so they will have their electives and core instruction virtually every day. And then they also have a time built in for remediation and homework where students can be divided into smaller groups and given specific skills to work on assigned by different teachers and um, additional help from teachers as needed. And the high school virtual schedule again follows their same block, 8 to 9.15 for block one, 9.30 to 10.45 for block two, a break for lunch in the middle of the day, 12 to 1.15 for block three, and 1.30 to 2.45 for the last block. So it models after a normal regular school day. Next is going to be um, the attendance. We will have to track attendance, both of the students who participate in the hybrid face-to-face and also students who are participating in virtual learning. Whether they're doing the hybrid virtual or the full virtual, uh, we will take attendance daily. There will be an electronic form that students will be able to fill out a very simple form just signing in to each class. They should participate in each lesson. Um, and completion of the daily assignments will be a part of attendance. So it won't be that the child can just sign in and get credit for attendance. They will have to complete whatever the assignment is from the teacher for that day in order to get a um, credit for attendance that day. Um, the consequences for tardies, and we are asking that parents notify the teacher in writing if their child is gonna be absent from the class that day, and also that teachers will notify parents if a child does not show up in class for that day so that they parents can help track this even if they're not at home with their children while they're doing the virtual learning. We want that constant um, stream of communication going back and forth between the parents and the um, teachers so that we will know and can monitor the attendance. The principals also discussed the grading, taking in consideration the amount of um, instruction that was lost at the end of last school year and knowing that both of these models are very different from what we are used to. Um, we did modify our category and weights for grading, and we're giving a little less emphasis to the test this year, um, just because we want to focus on the students' continuity of learning and catching up what they have missed. So classwork daily assignments and quizzes will count 75%, and test projects and major assessments will count 25%. We also have outlined our expectations, both for the elementary and secondary students, parents and teachers. Um, we need you know, students to attend all sessions. We need them to com complete their assignments on time, communicate with their parents and teachers if they need additional help. Um, all of these expectations are lined out for both the students and then the parents and the teachers. Um, it's gonna, like I said, be a team effort to make this process work. So you can read through these expectations to see what we're asking for of each grade level or each student. Um, and again, parents, we're gonna really need your support in communicating with the teachers any concerns that you're having or any um, issues that you're having with your child um, and making sure that the child is provided what they need, making sure the devices are charged and ready to go, making sure they have a spot in the house as we're working with the hotspots now that have been um, purchased we're finding that they may work in certain rooms of the house better than others. So you may have to help the child figure out the best place to put, um, put the hotspot. Um, but these are the expectations, as I said, for both the students, the parents, and the teachers, if you'll scroll up a little bit. Ms. Pearson. I'm scrolling, do you see it? Oh, it, it was just slow moving, I see it now, thank you. <laughs> Um, and again, the teachers, we are asking that students log into their virtual lessons a few minutes early if it's a live virtual lesson um, to make sure that they can get in and be ready to start on time. We're asking teachers to log in a few minutes early to make sure that they're ready to start the lesson on time when it's a live virtual lesson. But I want to point out that if you choose the virtual model, please be aware that the days that the teachers are teaching the face to face students they will not be able to provide face-to-face -face virtual lessons. You will be participating in recorded videos that they um, are using or potentially um, videos from Virtual Virginia, which is a resource that the DOE has provided to us for free this year. Um, and so they will still be participating in virtual instruction, but it won't be necessarily live face-to-face -face with the teacher because the teacher will be in school doing the hybrid model and the face-to-face -face instruction with students. Um, so just please be aware of that. Um, we are working on the code of conduct that will go before the school board on Monday night and that will um, take into consideration um, the, the discipline aspect of the behavior as students are participating in virtual learning that will be outlined in the code of conduct. 
At this time, that ends my section. I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Pearson um, for the technology support. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Devices, Chromebooks and or laptops. All students in grades pre-K through 12 will receive a division assigned device. We haven't yet determined what will be the exact device for all students um, as the need may be different at the secondary level from the elementary level, but we do know that all students will receive um, a form of a division assigned device. Students are expected to use their device for the 2020-2021 academic school year and all students and parents will be required to read and complete the following documents. These documents are linked here. Um, the student device agreement is pretty much a document that the student will agree to the terms and conditions. Um, it's very basic, um, so um, it will be easy for the students to be able to understand what they're agreeing to. Um, the student technology use agreement is very similar to that. The parent and guardian device agreement, that is another device, that is another agreement that the parents will need to use to be able to check out the devices. And then of course, our remote learning checkout form in which each parent will receive a copy of this form, which outlines the device name, um, the mobile hotspot should you choose to receive one of those um, information that you may need in the event that there are any issues with the device. A device guide will be provided for students and parents that will outline our device agreement, at home care, troubleshooting tips and device shortcuts. Um, we wanted to include that because while we know that the students are used to using the devices, there are some troubleshooting tips that could um, help and it may result in you not, not having to call a teacher or to contact technical support, but to be able to troubleshoot from home. Mobile device hotspots. This is the big one. A lot of people have reached out um, about mobile devices and the hotspots and um, we're pleased to announce that we will be able to provide mobile hotspots for students needing at home internet access on a first come first serve basis and by request only. Please be reminded that students will receive a mobile device. So each child will receive a device, but not every child will receive a hotspot. The hotspots will be by household. So for example, if you are a parent and you have a child that attends Brunswick High School and you also have a child that attends Mahern Powelton, you would receive one mobile hotspot for that household. Um, the mobile hotspots are um, run off of an LTE data network. So Brunswick County Public Schools cannot guarantee um, the immediate connectivity by corporate carriers, very similar to your cellular service. Um, the connectivity may depend on your students at home location. The acceptable use policy is another document that the students will need to read to make sure that they agree to the terms and conditions. And um, as we start the 2020-21 academic school year, you'll be able to request a mobile hotspot from, um, by calling 434-848-3138, extension 4026. On-premise access, we also are pleased to announce that we still have our guest Wi-Fi networks um, at all five of our school locations. If a parent or a student wanted to use the guest network, there is no additional information that you would need to um, provide other than to accept the terms and agreement on the screen when you connect your device to that wireless network. Um, and from there, you will be okay to go ahead and use that internet connection. Our guest network days are um, seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and in an effort to provide the best connectivity as possible, we are blocking um, streaming sites from being connected to our network um, from, our from your devices to our network. So that is something to make sure that you um, can kind of understand as far as the connectivity, as well as maintaining our social distancing guidelines and rules um, per the governor for your on-site access. And here um, we've listed our guest network locations. Although you may have a student that attends Brunswick High School or um, Russell Middle School, if you live in close proximity to Red Oak Sturgeon, we suggest that you choose a site that's closest to your home um, just for convenience. But all of our schools do now, they now have a guest network that is available for student um, use. As it pertains to those guest, guest networks, if parents are coming to the guest network to use the guest network during normal school hours, we ask that you um, are mindful of the on-campus policy as it pertains to entry and exit of the building, which you will see some information later about visitors. Um, at no time should the school staff, administration, teachers be contacted from within the building for assistance. These individuals will be providing instruction for students participating in hybrid learning during that time, and we want to make sure that they can keep their focus on that part of 
um, the day. So if you require support while you're on site, there are a few contact numbers listed here um, for members of our technical team that should be able to assist you. Student email, online communication. Students in grades six to 12 will have access to a division assigned Office 365 email account. Parental consent must be provided for students to receive access to their division assigned email account. To ensure online safety, all students in grades six through 12 will be required to use their assigned account, account for hybrid and remote learning. Um, please be advised that we will not allow the use of personal email accounts. This is an important piece um, to make sure that I would like to cover because when we're looking at the devices and the connectivity and our student and parent communications, we wanna make sure that we are keeping our students safe and we do feel that we have um, additional safety measures in place that are somewhat different from what you would have with a personal email account that should assist with that. So if your child has not received um, an Office 365 email account, you can request that information from the Department of Technology. Instructional support, student access. Um, I'm sure most of the parents have heard of Google accounts from your students from coming home and having to do online um, learning. Um, at the conclusion of our school year this year. Um, all students in grades K through 12 will be required to use their division assigned Google account for hybrid and remote learning. By using their account, this will allow BCPS to assist with the safety of our students for providing online support. Their G Suite account access will provide um, connectivity to the following platforms, Google Classroom, Google Drive, Google Docs, Google Forms, Sheets, and Meet. Um, another additional fact to um, kind of touch bases on, as far as connectivity and student accounts, we also use a platform called Clever. And if your students are using their Google Classroom account or their Google account when they log into their device, then it will eliminate them having to remember multiple passwords because all of that information will be tied into their Google account. And we do realize that it's been quite some time since the students have used their accounts. So if you do need that information in the next section, um, you can contact your division ITRT for your school building. Um, we have those individuals listed here. And um, for those that are on the call, um, Brunswick High School, Russell Middle School, Mahern Powelton Elementary School, and Red Oak Sturgeon would be Jones K at BrunswickCPS.org. And that phone number is 434-848-3138, extension 4023. For Tetera Elementary School, it would be Newell S. And that phone number is 434-848-3138, extension 4011. So if your child needs assistance with username and passwords, access, instructional technology resources, if you as a parent want assistance with having additional resources to use at home with your child, then the division ITRTs will be a valuable resource for you to be able to use for that. As mentioned before, in our 1920 school year, we have the BCPS Google Sites webpage, which includes instructional materials that are available for print. Um, as you can recall, we use this website during our COVID um, shutdown for our parents to be able to print any materials that they needed and additional resources from the teachers. So this is still a resource that will be available for use. Monthly parent meetings, um, the Brunswick CPS Technology Department will host a monthly Zoom call with a Q&A session for technology assistance. While we know that our children are growing up in the age of technology, it's always great to have um, a little additional boost as, as it pertains to parents to learn about the resources, tools, and the technology tips for online learning. During this time, we will go over some of the resources that we use within our division that may be beneficial for you to be able to um, assist your child at home and or feel a little bit more comfortable about the virtual learning and or hybrid should you choose one of those options. And finally, we have the BCP, BCPS Technology Support Hotline. Students and parents will be able to contact the Division's Technology Support Hotline for assistance with devices, mobile hotspots, and basic troubleshooting needs. We've noticed just from our virtual session that there are some basic troubleshooting needs, and um, we're glad that we are, we are happy that we, are, we will be able to offer this support for our parents and students. Um, because sometimes it's just the click of a button that will make all of the difference to being able to access those devices without having to make contact or leave your home to um, return the device or go to the school. So that number is 434-848-3138, extension 4024. I will now turn it over to Ms. Leora Mallory. 
Thanks, Ms. Pearson. In regard to our school operations and health and safety precautions or procedures, um, we are following, following guidance from CDC, as well as the Virginia Department of Health and Virginia Department of Education. These are unprecedented times. The Center of Disease Control and the Virginia Phase Guidance have provided guidance for schools and school districts to the following um, for reopening of schools, regardless of the particular phase that's being implemented within our school system. Some of the guidance includes, but it's not limited to, implementation of strategies to prioritize the health of staff, students, and then mitigate disease transmission and uh, maintain healthy environments. Provide remote learning exceptions and teleworking options for students and staff who are at a higher risk of severe illness. Daily health screenings. Staff and students wearing face coverings when physical distancing cannot be maintained as is medically and developmentally appropriate. Face coverings are most important to wear in times when physical distancing cannot be maintained, but schools will have other prevention strategies in place. For example, health screenings, physical distancing, enhanced hygiene, and cleaning product, um, protocols, and then limits on gatherings. Based on these guidance expectations, Brunswick County Public Schools will implement the following plan of action to ensure safety, health, and well being of students, as well as faculty, staff, and guests entering our buildings. In regard to our social distancing, if you'll scroll down a little bit for me, Ms. Pearson. Thank you. During suspected or identified infectious disease outbreaks, such as the time that we're experiencing right now, several social distancing measures can be taken to reduce the spread of the infectious disease. For instance, discouraging the sharing of food and drinks avoiding the touching of your eyes, your nose, or your mouth, washing your hands frequently, and sanitizing often, displaying of social distancing markers and signage. In terms of our employees screening, to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to reduce the potential risk of exposure to our employees, we will be requiring employees to participate in a daily screening process which includes temperature reading and completion of a questionnaire re, um, related to COVID-19 symptoms. Our employees have been engaging in these practices since March the 23rd. In regard to our students screening, thank you. Temperature readings will be conducted daily by the school staff on all students upon arrival to school. Parents and guardians um, contact will be made for any students demonstrating symptoms of COVID-19 with the expectation that they will be picked up. Parents will be provided with information on COVID-19 symptoms so they can be pre so they can pre-screen their child prior to sending them to school. Parents are advised to keep students home if they're exhi exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Brown, who's gonna elaborate on additional operational procedures and practices. Good evening, thank you, Ms. Mallory. In regards to our facilities, schedules, and transportation accommodations, disinfection and cleaning procedures, Brunswick County Public Schools faculty and staff will be working to keep commonly touched surfaces, such as stairwell railings, door handles, computer keyboards, bathroom faucets and surfaces, drinking fountains will be closed, telephones and ele elevator buttons cleaned by wiping them down with hospital grade detergent based cleaner, EPA registered disinfectant or a 10 to one water bleach solution. During an infectious disease outbreak, the frequency of cleaning these commonly touched areas will be increased. In addition, we will stay in consultation with public health for guidance on the frequency regarding changing 
HVAC filters. When an employee or a student with a suspected infectious disease is identified and has left the building, it is important that their work area, along with any other known places they have been, are thoroughly clean and disinfected. Surfaces will be cleaned to remove dirt and soil with a cleaning agent and disinfect following manufactured recommendations. The person cleaning and disinfecting will wear masks, gloves, and should discard of them afterwards. Hands must be washed or sanitized at the completion of the procedure. During times of a specifically known or suspected disease outbreak, the school district will continue to consult with public health, both locally and statewide. Here we have a custodial cleaning general schedule uh, for end of day protocols. Classrooms will be cleaned with rags and disinfectant chemicals in high touch areas at the end of the day. Disinfectant and spray will happen in all high touch areas and workspaces, classrooms, offices, hallways, bathrooms, office space, uh, light mopping of hallways and washing rags after cleaning for reuse. During the school day, protocols such as cleaning the bathrooms hourly to disinfect toilets, stall doors and handles, sink faucets, door entries, floors, trash, walls and high, high traffic areas, disinfectant aerosol in uh, spaces, hallways, classrooms after transition, doorknobs, walls. Again, water fountains will be closed off, washing rags after cleaning for reuse. And again, we point out that the grounds will be covered largely by our district level maintenance team because our custodians will be busy with internal structure um, and maintaining the disinfectant process inside. Upon entrance uh, to school buildings for visitors, any visitor enter entering the building must have prior permission by an administrator or an office personnel in order to establish times that will not create a lack of social distancing in the building. Parents and visitors must wear a mask at all times while in the building. Parents and visitors will also be screened at the front entrance by a staff member with their temperature taken, as well as being required to hand sanitize before entering further into the building. Parents and visitors will check in using a prescribed procedure for visitors afterwards, the visitors will be escorted to designated areas. Visitors and parents will not be allowed to roam the hallways or go to their classroom, their child's classroom. All scheduled meetings, parents and visitors will be escorted to those places and escorted out at the conclusion of those times with hand sanitizer available for their use. In regards to our buses and vehicles, our school buses are cleaned by the drivers on a regular basis during the normal school year. However, during periods of suspected or confirmed infectious disease outbreak, consideration to the frequency of those cleaning schedules are increased. At the end of each route, the buses will be cleaned immediately after students disembark. When bus drivers complete their route at the end of the day, another cleaning will take place to ensure the buses prepare for the next day's route. These two recommended cleanings are based on the nature and spread of the disease and guidance from our public health department. Bus drivers may also consider wearing masks while on routes for their personal protection. The transportation and bus garage will oversee the cleaning of county vehicles that will be aligned with the bus cleanings based on students disembarking and preparation for the next day's route. Social distancing will be observed on bus transports for students with a limit of 10 to 15 students with consideration to the numbers of students from a given household. For example, if the minimum number of students allowed on a bus is 10 and there is a family of three students coming from the same household, the total number of students to ride that bus will be 13 students. In regards to our food service protocols, to observe social distancing guidelines and to limit movement throughout the building, Students will not have their meal service in the open cafeteria areas, but in their classrooms. Meals will be delivered by the nutritional services staff to classrooms to allow closer supervision and monitoring of students following safety guidelines. Guidelines for meal service will include sanitation before and after meals. Students must be seated before receiving meals. They must wash their hands and sanitize desks before consuming meals. And they must wash, sanitize their hands and desks after consuming meals. 
Students with food allergies will have their meals prepared following the direction of the physician and labeled accordingly. Their meals will be distributed with their class and not separately. It will be labeled for that student. Sharing of food will be prohibited and the teacher will enforce this as a classroom rule. In regards to our communication and communicating with stakeholders uh, during the infectious disease outbreak, VCS, VCPS will attempt to provide accurate, consistent, and timely communication with staff, students, and parents to instill and maintain public confidence in our schools. We will continue to coordinate with the Virginia Department of Health, Southside Health District to disseminate critical information from the health department to develop and deliver common health messages and educational materials in English and Spanish, and to demonstrate the school district is taking reasonable action to preserve the safety and health of our staff and students. To stay updated on the most updated information, we ask teachers, students, and parents to check their emails often. We ask and emphasize that parents must uh, keep their phone numbers and information updated with the school, so for messenger calls, um, visit our district website regularly, follow our social media platforms, and be mindful of the Remind app that is being used. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, as a result of the survey we did a few weeks ago, there was also a lot of concern over the social and emotional well-being of our students. So we did include in this plan um, some information here and resources. There will be a link to our website. Um, if you follow the um, directions here, you'll be able to find some social and emotional support resources. We've also listed here some of the community resources that are available. And um, for staff members, of course, they would contact the personnel office and Ms. Brown for um, assistance as well in the employee assistance program. In addition, DOE has provided a lot of resources for parents on their website, so we cut and pasted those here for your um, easy access. If you'll scroll down a little bit, Ms. Pearson, you'll be able to see that this gives you lots of resources um, for being able to talk to your child about COVID, um, what it means for school-age children, um, some resources for dealing with stress and anxiety, um, as this is um, a different time for everyone and can be very stressful, both for us as adults and especially for the children. Um, we wanted to make sure that these resources were at your fingertips um, for your use. And that really concludes the draft plan at this time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Majet. All right, thank you. Um, and I do appreciate all the good questions that are coming in. I am gonna um, call on you panelists for some of the questions that we had um, a few parents that submitted questions prior to today uh, through Mrs. Clary. So I'm going to get started. So I apologize, you'll see me working from a few different devices. Um, Ms. Williams asked, uh, Ms. Rogers, I assume this question will be for you, and it's multiple parts. It's um, what, are, what are the plans that are in place for governor school students? And then will governor school students still be picked up? Okay. Yes, Governor School is supposed to be sending out a letter to those students um, this week, as a matter of fact. Um, it's my understanding that they have decided to do their um, schooling virtually as well. They will be doing mostly virtual. And if your child is in one of the science lab classes, they may need to attend for face-to-face -face instruction periodically throughout the year, on, but not on a daily basis. So they are going to be providing us, I believe we even got the email later to this afternoon uh, with the schedule of how often the students would need to go to school. Um, so we should be able to provide the transportation for that. Other than that, they will be participating virtually in governor school. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, for Mrs. Rogers and Dr. Thornhill. If they opted for remote learning at the high school for the two classes that they need to take, um, will they be able to take them remotely? Yes, all of the high school courses are available remotely. The CTE are the ones that we are encouraging for parents to come in and I mean for the students to come in and do those face to face because they involve so much hands on activity. Um, but even those if a parent is not comfortable with that um, can also do the CTE classes virtually. Okay. Uh, the next question is and it's lengthy it's multiple parts, but I believe it's going to mostly be Mrs. Pearson um, and Mrs. Rogers. What if we homeschool our students because they don't feel safe sending kids back to school? 
I have one Chromebook and I'm about to purchase another one. What time would the kids get up? How will classes be set up if they have to do social distancing? Um, the diagram that was presented with the survey only shows about eight kids in the classroom. Some classes have more than, had more than eight kids before the crisis began. Um, you know, how will bus routes be? How will parents that work full time know about the bus schedule and hours? And if the parent wants homeschooling, will the same material be the same throughout the school year? Okay, I think I can take this one. Um, I think this is referring to the virtual learning option and not homeschooling. Homeschooling is a totally different um, animal, but if you're choosing the virtual learning, uh, we will be providing the, the devices, so you will not need to get an additional Chromebook. We will be providing devices for each of our students. The content will be the same for the students if they participate in the hybrid or virtual, it would be the same. We're going to use the same curriculum, same resources that we've used in the past with the addition of virtual Virginia lessons that are now available to us. The curriculum will be the same, so it would be um, the same thing they would have gotten in the regular school year, just either virtually. And the diagram that we shared, um, because we are only having either a third of the students come each day or at the elementary level, the whole grade level is coming, but those students will be split up in multiple classes depending on the class size and the classroom. Most of our classrooms can hold eight to 10 students depending on the size of the room. The maintenance department has already gone in to measure each room to figure out how many desks can fit in there um, with the six foot social distancing. So that's how we're able to um, have the smaller numbers in the classrooms. This classes would be split among multiple rooms and because we're not bringing all students every day, we'll have fewer students riding the buses and we're able to then spread them out. And the transportation department has worked on bus routes and potentially even using buses from other schools where needed to provide um, the, the buses to bring the students into school. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from Ms. Davis. Um, and there's a few questions there. Uh, the first question, and I apologize for not even clarifying this at the beginning, but it says, why doesn't the administrative team consist of at least one public health professional on the panel? Um, and did want to let you know, um, may have alluded to it briefly, and I know Ms. Mallory uh, mentioned it. We um, consult on a regular basis with the Virginia Department of Health and the Health Department. Actually, since this um, pandemic, um, we became aware of it. Ms. Mallory and the school nurses have been in constant contact and, and working through this. So um, they are, the public health professionals are spread relatively thin, um, but I assure you we are following the guidelines that they've set forth and provide that information to us. Um, the next question is what happens if a parent has to work 40 hours a week and the child goes to school about two days a week? You know, who, um, you know, who's gonna educate the child? And they had some questions about childcare. Um, and that is one of those tough uh, questions that I can't say we have a definitive answer for. Um, we recognize that childcare is going to be a challenge. We do understand your concerns. Um, the best suggestion that we can give you at this point is talking with your childcare provider that you normally use uh, when school is not in session. Um, you know, again, um, I don't think any option is really um, absolutely ideal. Uh, at the same time, I don't think any of us could have imagined that right now we would be dealing with a, uh, a global pandemic. So I think ultimately, um, those are going to have to be some things that, that you probably coordinate with your child care provider. Uh, there was another question about school buses being sanitized. I know Ms. Brown touched on that, about it being sanitized twice a day after each run. Um, and then there are questions about masks. So, I'm going to uh, ask this of Mrs. Rogers and Ms. Mallory, but essentially, will it's two parts. Will faculty and staff be required to wear a mask all day? And then will students be required to wear a mask all the time? So yes, um, in regard to our faculty and our staff, the wearing of a mask will be strongly encouraged um, for our students um, on the school buses when social distancing cannot be practices doing in the educational settings. Um, face coverings are recommended by the CDC as a simple barrier for, pre for prevent, preventing, excuse me, respiratory um, droplets from traveling. So um, we want everybody to remain healthy and safe. In regard to our faculty and staff, um, they will be wearing uh, masks as well. 
um, and we are actually um, in the process of purchasing masks for our faculty and staff um, so that they will be properly equipped um, when we return back to school. Um, this question came up earlier in regard to um, students regarding their mask. If parents have masks that they have already purchased for their students and feel comfortable with them wearing those masks that they purchased, we know that some of them might have designer masks. Um, you know, that's the new thing now. And so we encourage you to go ahead and send your child to school with um, their personalized mask. Um, however, if a child does show up and does not have a mask, a mask will be provided for them. Thank you. Um, next question, how will teachers social, um, promote social distancing with children from ages four to nine years old? Okay, this will have to be um, handled by the teachers much as they would do any of their procedures and routines that they teach at the beginning of the year. Um, how to line up, how to sharpen your pencil, those types of things. All of those are things that are reviewed and taught at the beginning of every year. So this year we will just have to add what is social distancing? What does that mean? We don't shake hands. We don't hug at school. Uh, while we hate that that's the reality, that's the reality we're under. Um, and we will also provide some things to assist with uh, markings on the floor to show them what six feet apart look like. As I stated before, the desk will already be set up six feet apart in the classroom, so they'll be able to see what that looks like. But we're just going to have to make this a daily practice of teachers reminding and teaching um, those procedures and routines to the students so that they understand what um, social distancing means. All right, next question. What if my child shows symptoms of COVID-19 at school? What steps are going to be taken to care for my child? And I, probably Ms. Mallory. Yes, ma'am. So if your child shows symptoms of COVID-19 in the school setting, um, they will be sent to a designated location um, where the screening protocols will be followed, the parent or guardian will be contacted with the expectation that the child will be picked up. Okay. All right, and it kind of goes into the next question. It says, will they be testing at school? And we're assuming that they're, they mean COVID-19 testing. And the school system will not be providing COVID-19 testing. Um, in the past couple of weeks, Brunswick County um, has provided, Brunswick County being the, um, the local government, has provided opportunities for citizens to participate in um, local COVID-19 testing. Uh, it was housed or, or um, administered over across from Brown's Funeral Home at the um, old St. Paul's Thomas um, building. So please stay on the lookout for future opportunities to participate in COVID-19 testing that may be um, coming as a result of the local government. Okay. Um, and the next question is, what steps are we taking to ensure the safety of students? Um, Ms. Brown or either Ms. Mallory? Yes, ma'am. So Brunswick County Public Schools are taking the following steps to ensure the safety of all of our students. We're having daily sanitation of our buses and vehicles, wearing of masks, um, screening procedures, which include daily temperature readings um, upon the arrival to school buildings. Um, hand, sanita hand sanitation stations are set up. We're promoting um, hand washing, social distancing markers, as well as signage is available. Um, and reducing the number of people occupying our educational settings. We want all of our children to remain healthy and safe. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to answer some of the text message questions. Um, parents and guardians, after I answer your questions, you'll just see why I just write back thanks. And if you have a follow-up, um, please feel free to send it. And then um, I will, after this, answer the questions that are in the chat feature. So if you put the question in the chat feature, you don't have to text or vice versa. I have it, I'm gonna, we're gonna make sure we get every single question. Um, and then if there's something I need clarity for, if you could just write back um, to let us know the clarity. So the first question I have, um, if your child has an IEP with modifications going to Brunswick High School for the first time, will all of their classes be virtual? Ms. Mallory, Ms. Rogers. So if the child has an IEP um, going to Brunswick High School, 
it is going to, to deter, de, um, depend on, one, what's stated in the IEP for their services, um, whether they're getting collaborative type settings. Um, it will also depend on the child's disability um, as to what's going to be best for the education of that child. Some of our students are um, coming in or planning, the parents are planning to send them in for the hybrid, to participate with the hybrid, which is, you know, a combination of the face-to-face -face as well as virtual learning. Um, and then some may be participating in all virtual learning. Again, this is gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so please feel free to reach out to my department, 434-848-3138, option one, option five, and we can discuss further. Okay, thank you. All right, this next one is five questions. Um, so I just want to make sure that they're all covered. Um, the first one was, will the child be required to wear a mask the whole school day? And I believe you touched on that, that it is the expectation um, that the um, child wear the mask. Um, but there's a second part to this question. Will children with physical conditions such as asthma um, be more than six feet away from others, being that they can get um, that, excuse me, being that they can um, I guess get sick, making sure that that additional distance, so maybe not just the six feet, but maybe a little farther apart to ensure that those children would not get sick. So in regard to that, um, I'm going to say for all asthmatic kids, they generally have a individualized health care plan or um, is following their asthma plan that we consult with their doctors on. Um, and when I say we, meaning the nurses for the school system, for the school that your child is assigned to, um, and those plans get, uh, are individualized. So if the child is needing more distancing than the six feet, that can be discussed and placed into their um, health care plan or their, um, the asthma plan when it's reviewed with the nurse and the staffing. So um, just please reach out to your school nurse um, in regard to addressing that further and making sure that it's outlined so that we can um, make sure that we meet your needs of your student. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next part, I'm probably going to put this for Ms. Pearson. Will the school plans be mailed home? No. Well, eventually they will, but right now, as far as today, they will not be mailed home because um, that information is still seeking board approval. So. All right. Um, if the kids are doing online classes, are they required to take SOL? <laughs> um, at this time, it is our understanding that um, SOL testing is actually a federal mandate. It is not a state mandate. Um, so at this time, what we've been told is that the federal government has not indicated that they plan to waive SOL tests for next year. So we believe that we will still be taking SOL tests, whether you are virtual or hybrid, if you are in an SOL course that's either third grade through eighth grade reading, math, science, history, or an end of course test um, course at the high school, then yes, there may be an SOL test at the end of the year next year. Um, Dr. Lane has indicated that starting, if we start school under phase three, under this, these models, that he will then um, be asking for the accreditation for schools to be waived. Not necessarily that the test would not take place, but that the results of the test may not affect our accreditation. This question may also be referencing um, this past year, we were given the ability to give local verified credits for some of the SOL courses at the high school because we did not take the test. We do not know yet what that's going to look like for next year and if that waiver will still be available to give local verified credits or not. And as soon as we have that information, we will pass that along to the parents and to the schools. All right, thank you. Um, next question from Ms. Duggar. Um, child's in second grade, is she required to come to school or can she do all virtual learning? She can do all virtual learning if that's what the parent selects. Okay. Thank you. Um, I realized I left a question off of the other one. Uh, for Ms. Mallory, how will students with special needs be accommodated, um, like having more um, hands-on opportunities? Will they have that? Yes, so we're working with, um, the, we being the schools, the individual schools are working with, um, in collaboration with the exceptional ed teachers and the parents. There are 
times in the schedules for remediation. Um, some uh, students with certain um, disabilities are being identified for coming in more often than other students. It really depends on your child and what the disability is and, um, and what areas they are being serviced in, meaning the areas identified in their IEP. Um, so it's kind of going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. All right. The uh, next set of questions, I believe the first two will be for Mrs. Rogers, I mean for Mrs. Pearson, the last for Ms. Rogers. Um, if I choose, would it be okay if I purchase my own Chromebook for my child to use? While we would, we recommend the division assigned device, we can't um, give you guidance on whether or not you could purchase personally for your child. Um, I do suggest that if you are purchasing, then a Chromebook would be an ideal device to um, purchase, but we can't say, um, no, you may not purchase for your child. Okay. Uh, second question, um, definitely a tech question. <laughs> if users are experiencing issues with hotspots, computers might work better if both the laptop and hotspot are set to use five um, gigahertz of bandwidth. Um, a lot of wireless devices, Xbox, wireless controller, PlayStation, wireless cordless phones, et cetera, use 2.4 gigahertz and can cause interference. And in most end users' homes, five gigahertz band is much quieter and less interference. Okay, thank you for that information. As it pertains to the mobile <laughs> hotspots that we currently have deployed, our, the, the services and the package that we have comes from the corporate carrier. So um, whatever they provide for us is what we would actually receive and be able to offer. Um, but thank you so much for that information. Yes, I said this is definitely a <laughs> set question. Um, and then the next one is how would you, how would a situation be handled with a kindergarten student that is tired of wearing a mask for a few hours and keeps removing it? Okay, that's a great question, and obviously um, we, we've considered that, and that's why we're saying that they, we are, the expectation is that they will wear them when the social distancing um, is not available. Um, that we recognize that the younger children will probably have to take them off at times, and when they're sitting in their classrooms and they're sitting six feet apart from each other, it may be possible for them to take, that, take it off for a little while and get a breather from it. Um, but if they have to walk down the hall to go to the restroom or something, we will want them to put it back on. So um, the teachers will be in, in charge of saying, you know, now it's time to put your mask on um, or it's okay to take it off for a little while. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Carter and Mrs. Rogers. Will the middle school be on an A-B schedule like last school year? No, the uh, middle school will not be on an A-B schedule like last school year. And the um, A-B schedule for last year did not involve most core classes. It was limited use for some elective classes and history and their science class. This year, students will have elective class on a rotation and exploratory basis. For example, a student in the first nine weeks may have a computer information systems as the elective course for the first nine weeks. And then in the second nine weeks, that elective could change to PE. And in the third nine weeks, it would rotate into career investigation. And the science and social studies would not operate in an AB on days that they are in school, the in-person class, the students will have half of their time in science and half of their time in social studies. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, next question, I wanted to know, uh, will second grade be able to do virtual learning every day of the week for the 2021 school year? Yes, they will do it every day. And I know based on the schedule, it may look like um, that they are only doing learning on the day that they're in class, but keep in mind, they will, if, they're, if you choose the hybrid model, they will have classes both in school for two days a week in second grade, but they will also have assignments and online instruction and things to do when they are at home. I failed to mention that we will continue to use instructional packets as well as we did at the end of the year. 
um, and, and students who come to school will get those packets and be able to take them home and the parents who choose the virtual option, we will have to figure out a way to get those packets to you as well so that um, the students can still have some paper and pencil type activities to do as well. But um, yes, they can, they will have class actually five days a week, even the days that the teachers have planning, um, the students will still have assignments and things that they need to do. Okay. All right, this next question is for Dr. Harrison and Mrs. Rogers. You may want to pull up, yep, you got the elementary schedule up. Um, as far as first and second grade students are concerned, what is the plan for non-virtual students? So they wanted to see what that plan was, the schedule for Red Oak Sturgeon. Okay, so Red Oak Sturgeon, first grade students will attend on Wednesday and Thursday. Second grade students will attend on Monday and Tuesday. Okay. All right, the next que question is from Ms. Brandy. It's a few different questions. How will students riding the bus have a health screening done? And then how will parents driving to and from school be able to pick up drop off students while minimizing groups? And I think we'll do a question at a time. So how will students riding the bus have a health screening done? So Ms. Brown, Ms. R Mallory. Sorry. Okay, so the um, health screening will be done once the student reaches the school. Um, prior to that, it is the expectation that the student wears a mask on the school um, bus. Um, we're asking our parents to work collaboratively with us to ensure the safety and health um, and well-being of all of our students. And so with that being said, um, we are going to be having parents to pre-screen their students before their children before leaving um, the home setting. And when we talk about pre-screening, what we mean is we'll be providing you with some information of symptoms regarding to um, COVID-19. And uh, if your child is displaying any of those symptoms or flu-like symptoms, once we get into the flu season, we're asking for you to please make provisions for your child and keep them at home. Um, no one works well when they're sick, and so we're asking that you please don't send them um, on the school bus. It is in the best interest of all students. Okay, um, and then how will parents driving to and from school be able to pick up drop off students um, while minimizing, I guess, being in, in larger groups? It's probably going to be a little different at each school, but um, can you go back to the, the visitor piece Brown. there, Ms. Brown, and maybe just touch on that? Okay. So with the, the, the drop-off and pickups, those will be um, established by the principals in coordination with transportation to minimize the large population of entry and departure from the building. Um, again, with coming into the building, these guidelines as far as um, parents needing to have permission, um, having to wear a mask, having to be screened to come in the building, that's for entering the building. But if you're picking up your child at the end of the day, the principals will establish that with support from staff at their schools and communicate that as the same as Rogers referenced about, these are the protocols that we're gonna follow and teach the kids when they arrive at the beginning and start of the year, as well as them communicating that out to the parents. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, and I've seen it pop up a few times. Um, will we be able to change from the hybrid to the virtual based on how comfortable we are. So if we start with a hybrid model as a parent, are we able to shift to the virtual? Um, yes, we have talked about this. And if you um, start under the hybrid model and wanna switch to virtual, that will be an easy transition to make. However, if you start under virtual and wanna to switch to hybrid, that involves looking at bus routes, class sizes, in order to make sure that we can maintain. So we are asking parents that you don't do the reverse, switch from the virtual to the hybrid. But if you are starting under hybrid and then you begin to feel uncomfortable um, with your child attending, you could switch to the virtual model. Okay, all right. And then uh, next question, will the kids have recess? Um, and other specials at the elementary school, like library and PE? 
Yes, they will have specials. Um, it was not necessarily shown in the schedule that we showed because they're going to have to work out that um, the logistics of that. Um, we have like, for example, our PE teacher is shared among the three schools. Some of them may be virtual um, classes for the specials. And it is, um, according to the guidance, we can do recess. We have to minimize, you know, the number of students that are out there and um, what they are actually, um, what they are allowed to touch and so forth. So that is a conversation that we still really need to look at and um, have a little more talk with the principals about what that's gonna look like and then being able to clean and sanitize those um, resources outside that the students would use while they were having recess. But we know that recess is an important part for younger children. Um, so we are gonna work on what we can do to provide that um, the days that they are in school. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, next set of questions, I think Ms. Mallory hit on this about students with special needs having extra time to do their schoolwork and assistance. Um, can you just touch on that briefly again, Mallory? Sure, yes ma'am. So um, at the various schools, there are remediation times. Um, there's also, if your student is in the class for collaboration, there's time for them um, to one, get with their uh, exceptional ed teacher um, to work on work that's being done in that collaborative setting. Um, and again, um, we can work with the between the exceptional ed teachers, the general ed teachers, um, and the administration of your child's school work with you for getting you additional um, assistance. And there are some populations that are coming into the schools um, more frequently as well. Got it, and I got more clarification from the parents. She was basically saying, oh, the parents basically saying, no, what about being able to complete, I guess, extra assistance, complete the work for that day and they don't want it to count against the child's attendance if they can't get all the work completed in that day. Oh, okay, sure. Allowances will be made, and that's on an individual basis. It's not a, um, not a uniform matter, but an individual basis. We recognize that some of our kids do need additional, additional time to work on assignments, and, and it also varies from assignment to assignment. So, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, next question, when are we um, expecting to allow children back into schools? I know school is, uh, begins August 10th. I'm not sure if that's the exact question, um, but in terms of allowing all students back into school, um, we're just not there yet. We're, we're at this step just trying to get feedback on looking on a, a very uh, minimal basis um, so that, you know, while the guidance has provided um, when you look at phase three under what the Department of Education has given us, um, essentially we have the latitude to bring, you know, all students back. Um, but the concern is, is that this is still very new. Um, I've never experienced anything like this and I'm pretty sure many of us have in this lifetime. So we're just trying to be as cautious and as careful as we, we can be. So I can't tell you when we'll get back to having everybody in school in the traditional sense that, um, what well, wouldn't be my recommendation um, in the traditional sense, um, I would say any anytime soon until we kind of know where we are with this thing. Um, there was a question about bus routes. Um, in the past, I believe had to be doubled, the child was late. Um, the, this is gonna be very different. It's gonna be very few students on those buses. We have gone through um, and, and mapped all of this out to, um, to ensure that, um, you know, we can do the social distancing and working on keeping the students um, and the driver uh, as safe as absolutely possible. Um, and with doing that, are there gonna be kinks? Yes. Are there gonna probably be some delays? Yes, um, because this is still relatively new um, I don't think just for Brunswick, I think for everybody trying to figure out what do we do next. Um, the, you know, there was a question concern about, you know, are we going to infect all the students on the bus since there won't be any screening. Um, part of the concern with screening at a bus stop, if we screen you, we screen your child, um, every child's family is different. So every parent isn't going to be there at that bus stop. Um, we can't just leave a kid on the side of the road and say, well, you know, um, you don't meet the requirements. 
Um, you don't, you know, hey, you didn't meet a temperature check or you didn't check the right box on the screening and we're gonna leave you here. Um, we, we still are in for care of your child. When your child hits that bus stop, they're in our care as well. So just making sure, let me get some more. Just making sure that um, we all work together to follow that expectation, to make sure um, that we're wearing that mask. Actually, I was on a state call this morning and one of the things that they were saying was, um, the key is, is getting that mask on prior to entering that bus and not lingering in long periods of time with one another. So with that social distancing of having those children staggered in every other seat, get on and having the parents um, support us in um, reinforcing, have your mask, put your mask on, get on the bus um, in, in, you know, in your assigned seat and let's travel to school um, and, and just keep our distance from one another. So those are the things that we have in place. Is it foolproof? Um, can I ever guarantee you that someone will not contract COVID-19? No. I mean, you just don't know. None of us really know. Um, but we are going to keep them socially distanced and make sure they do the mask and everything as well. Uh, and it was another question, be contacted if someone screens positive. Ms. Mallory? So in regard to um, if someone is screened, um, if someone is comes back as a positive um, for COVID-19, um, let me say that in regard to the screening, we won't be determining that someone is positive for COVID-19. We're saying that they are, just, they are demonstrating symptoms of, and then they will have to go to their primary care um, or urgent care or whatever um, to have testing done or follow up um, to get confirmed. If we have a confirmed case for COVID-19, then we will um, be consulting with our Virginia Department of Health epidemiologists um, in regard to doing some contact tracing um, so that we can determine what, we can determine what, um, which students that student came in contact with or that faculty member came in contact with. At that point, notification will be given to those individuals that they have come in contact with someone who um, either is displaying symptoms of COVID-19 or has a confirmed case of COVID-19 and may need to quarantine for 14 days if that's still the guidance from CDC or Virginia Department of Health. It may be less than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mallory, stay yes, put, uh, to clarify. <laughs> Uh, high school students with an active IEP, do they have to attend in person um, or can they do total virtual if their accommodations are needed? How would you handle it? They can do total virtual learning. Um, it will depend on what accommodations are indicated in the IEP. We will make every effort um, to be able to provide those accommodations. Again, these are, are uncharted territories that we're entering right here. Um, so if it's something that we can't meet, we'll look at how we can modify the accommodations to be able to best serve that child. Um, it is up to the parent as to um, them having the opportunity to come into the school setting or to participate in a virtual setting. And so if you're choosing for them to be in a, a virtual setting, understand, or a total virtual setting, understand there may be some limitations um, to their participation in, in a totally virtual setting. But again, we're gonna work with you if you, we're asking for you to work with us to continue to meet the best needs of your child. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Pearson, yes. how would I go about signing my child up for virtual learning for next school year? Um, well, we will, we, as Dr. Majette stated earlier, a survey will go out soon um, for you to be able to choose which option you would like for your child. And we ask that you fill out the survey. If you have multiple children, fill out that survey per child. Um, as the needs may be different depending upon which child you are completing the survey for. And then there will, uh, there will also be an additional option there to determine whether or not you would need a mobile hotspot for your home. Perfect. Ms. Brown, what's the maximum that, of number of students that can be on a bus? Um, we are basing it at 10, but once again, as I stated earlier, 
if there is a household that has three children that are going to be coming onto the bus, then we will be able to increase that number to 13 that day. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mallory, if they're showing symptoms, will they be allowed to return to school? If so, what length of time will they be quarantined? So if they're showing symptoms um, at the present time, it depends on a couple of factors. If you're showing symptoms, um, it depends on the symptoms you're showing. It depends on, it depends on um, consultation with medical um, providers. Um, so the guidance right now is a 14 day quarantine. Um, but again, it, it's, it's gonna call for the nurses to contact you and have some discussion with you around the particulars for your child. It's, it's not a one um, fit model for everyone. So we just want you to understand that in, in some cases when we're con contacting our epidemiologists and they are um, advising us um, on what needs to transpire with, with the individual, it may vary from person to person depending on your what's going on with you. Um, okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Can you touch on governor school again, Ms. Rogers, briefly? What's the plan? Yes, the governor's school itself is supposed to send letters to those students this week. Um, they have decided that they will be providing their instruction virtually for the upcoming school year, um, except for some of the science lab classes. Um, periodically, those students will need to come in for face-to-face -face instruction, um, but from the schedule that was sent earlier today, it is spread out maybe once every couple of weeks um, that they may need to come in for face-to-face -face instruction. So um, it will be mostly virtual this year. All right, Ms. Pearson, question from Mr. Gilliam. Uh, two questions, how and, will, how and when will the Chromebooks be distributed? And then do the hotspots have unlimited data? Okay, so we're still working out the logistics for the deployment for the Chromebooks. Um, we really won't be able to determine what the need will be until we get the survey, even though we are um, suggesting that we can provide a device for every child as stated before. Some parents may want to purchase their own devices and in that sense, we wouldn't need a device for that child to be distributed. Um, the plan, pre-plan is to distribute by school and we will send out instant messenger alerts and additional communications from your school building as well as the division level to be able to um, allow you to know when, when and where to pick up. And I'm sorry, Dr. Majet, what was the other part of that question? Um, Hotspots, do they have unlimited data? Okay, the hotspots. Um, as per our subscription, the hotspots do not have unlimited data. Um, they have 22 gigs of data per month, and then there is a reduction in, in service after that, um, reduction speed, but you would still have service. Um, an alternative to that is if your child is busy, is a busy bee and they're really enjoying virtual learning and they use the 22 gigs of data, you do have the option of using our guest networks at any of our locations, um, which provides unlimited access for you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a parent just providing some feedback, just a thought. It would be nice if the parent, um, if, if a parent chose all the all virtual model to have tutors for the virtual student, this way the teacher in the classroom will not have to take extra time with virtual students after being with the students in class all day. So that was um, a parent suggestion. So we will note that. Um, the next question, uh, middle school, um, whatever, whatever day my child has chosen to go to school, will it be the same day each week? Yes. It will be. Thank you. All right. Uh, will a student who has displayed symptoms be allowed to return to school without seeking medical attention? No, they will not. Okay. Let's see. Uh, next question. Um, who do they need to contact to fill out um, paperwork for homeschooling? And I did clarify whether that was homeschooling or virtual. So who would they need to make contact with? Um, Elizabeth Rainey at the central office handles the paperwork for homeschooling. So you can call her um, at 848-3138. Again, that's Ms. Rainey, and she can give you the documents that you need to complete for homeschooling. Okay. All right, got a question from Ms. Tamika saying new guidelines, the students can be three feet apart. If wearing masks, will you be making masks mandatory for students? or changing anything to adhere to that guideline as far as buses, class capacity, scheduling, et cetera. Um, 
I will say with that, I know that there's some information coming out about that. I can just say on for our video e guidance, um, there are certain provisions that, um, and, and these are decisions that are not at my level. These would be board decisions, and that would be um, with additional guidance from the from the VDH. Um, from what we heard this morning, it's still encouraged for us to maintain the six feet of social distancing, even as we go into phase three, because um, uh, there is a great uh, deal of, um, of, of risk that, that's still there. Um, because there are various studies that are going out. I've seen some things recently as at the weekend that were saying that they've noticed that some droplets have gone up to 15 feet apart. So I, I, I'm just still being very cautious with um, the new guidance that's coming out. Um, also, if we call and request it for the hotspot earlier for the upcoming school year, not summer school, do we have to call back and request one before August? Um, the, yes. Well, you wouldn't have to call back. You would just need to complete the survey and indicate that you would like to receive a hotspot. Currently, we're only deploying hotspot for our virtual summer school. So if you did call um, and you were unable to receive, then that is the reason why. But if you complete the survey at the conclusion of um, the call, once we release that information, then you can indicate that you would like to reserve a hotspot at that time. Okay. All right. Um, can you repeat the kindergarten hybrid schedule again, Ms. Rogers? Yes, kindergarten is face-to-face um, -face in the building on Mondays and Tuesday at all three elementary schools. So I'm not sure what school they were asking about, but kindergarten is face-to-face -face Monday and Tuesday at all three schools. Okay, all right, leave it on the elementary. Dr. Weich and Ms. Rogers. Um, Dr. Weich, which days will the fifth grade attend, and I'm assuming in person at Totero? On Monday. Okay, so fifth grade is on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then will there be face coverings, um, are face coverings needed for children with disabilities or special needs children? Yes. Okay. All right, next question. Will the nurses be on site every day at schools? So the nurses will be on site. Um, we only have a uh, two full-time nurses and one part-time nurse. Um, we also have um, specialized uh, paraprofessionals who assist us with meeting the medical needs of students um, and trained office um, or school staff, I should say, additional school staff who have been trained and will be ad receiving additional training in regard to um, COVID-19, but we conduct an annual medication um, administration and addressing of um, health situations training for our designated staff. So this year, um, that training will include some additional training around COVID-19. That's how we address um, the needs of our, meeting our kids at all five school levels, as we don't have five individual nurses to put at every school. We'd love to do that. Um, but at the present time, we don't. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, Dr. Thornhill and Mrs. Rogers, how many days a week um, that 11th grade student would have class? Um, and I guess that would be determined by the CTE courses. Right. And also, if we choose virtual and we find that it's not the best fit for the child, can we pull them back in for face-to-face? So, um, again, that's going to be a little bit harder because um, we're having to set up this, um, this the class sizes and the bus routes based on the numbers. So to go from virtual back to hybrid um, would be very difficult. And um, I can't say that it, we can't do it under um, extenuating circumstances, um, but we are encouraging parents not to switch from virtual back to hybrid. If you start as hybrid and want to switch to virtual, that's an easy transition. And as far as how many days an 11th grader, they have class um, five days a week. If they are in CTE, depending on whether their CTE class is on an A day or a B day, they would attend just those two days that they have the CTE class. Um, and if they're banned, you know, same thing, we've split the band into two groups, so they will either be an A day band or a B day band. So technically coming into school, they may only come two days a week, but they will have class five days a week. Correct. Okay. Um, and there was another question about school starting August 10th. Yes, the schedule 
um, is still um, set at, as August 10th. All right, let's see a uh, few more on the phone and then the um, chat, I'm gonna get to you. Ms. Whitaker, um, she's a parent who'd like her child to be 100% virtual for safety reasons. Um, wanted to know, would there be any assistance in terms of internet costs? And I think Ms. Pearson, you had covered that. You are gonna be providing the hotspots for the homes. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, also, she missed the extension uh, number that you gave to request the hotspot. Um, can you share that number again, please? Um, actually, what you would need to do would be to um, fill out the survey to be able to request the hotspot. Um, and then once you fill out the survey, then we will have your information to be able to determine your need. Okay, awesome. All right, uh, will tonight's webinar be available for review? Will the video be posted online? Yes, it will. Okay. Let's see. Yep, it was an, uh, another question. Um, let's see, Ms. Hartman, will all of these charts be available online to view if they called in tonight? So, you, Ms. Pearson? Um, they will be available online pending board's approval um, because this is just a draft plan, so we can't post immediately. We still have to get the approval of the board to be able to do so. But we do have a, um, on our division website, traditionally we post um, items in our news and announcement section, but we now have a link. It's um, directly in between the parents and teachers tab, and it's actually called 2020-2021. I have to get the exact name for it. But it's a um, it's a back to return to school plan link, and that's where you will find the additional 2020 2021 return to school. If you click that link, that's where you, um, we will house our videos, our plan, and any other additional items that we have um, as they come forth. Okay. Um, next question: Is there a plan for school lunches going forward to be utilized in the PEBT, or is there another plan in place for low income families once school has started? Excuse me. And so with the meal service, we will do a pickup uh, situation, the same as we did um, from March to the end of the school year. So that will be the provision for students who are virtually, they are, they will be given the option to be able to come in and pick up their meals. Okay, thank you. And then there was another question about repeating the number for requesting a hotspot device. And that is, Ms. Pearson just said that it will, um, be resolved on throughout the survey. Uh, the middle school, do they have classes on Fridays or is Friday just for staff? They do not have, uh, the students will still have assignments to do on Friday, but it is not face-to-face -face instruction on Friday. That is a planning day for staff. Um, they will have some office hours but during, on that day, but the students again will have all students, either hybrid or virtual, will have class and assignments five days a week. Okay. All right. Um, what is the requirement or stipulation as the choice for the learning style chosen for the child? Is this on the semester basis or for the school year? At this time, you're selecting now. And as Dr. Majet mentioned, we don't know how long we'll be under phase three and when we may be able to switch to doing something different. Um, so obviously, if, as we get new guidance, um, we will come back to you and, and let you know if we can open it up to um, going to all students returning to school, um, but as you're selecting it now, you're selecting it uh, with the anticipation that it's all year unless we get further guidance changing it. Okay, thank you. And last question that I have via phone, if you have a high school student, uh, so Dr. Thornhill, Mrs. Rogers, if you have a high school student and she is in a nursing program and I want online only, but she may have to go one day for the nursing program, will it be a problem if I choose online only um, we don't want her to do the class that has to be hands-on, but feel everything else. We do want her to do the class that's hands-on, but we do feel like everything else needs to be online only, and that's for Ms. Tara. Did you want okay. me to have um, Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. No, you can go ahead, Dr. Thornhill. <laughs> no, no, it's basically, uh, she can do it either way. However, she will have to work that out with the uh, instructor, uh, Ms. Lynch, and I'm sure she's pretty flexible with that. Uh, mainly she just want her, if she's working on clinicals or something else, uh, she needs to come in that particular day, but she does have that option. Okay. All right. Uh, now to the chat, Ms. Young, 
if you're not comfortable sending your child to school, but both parents work during the day, how would the child receive virtual learning? This is um, and this goes back to, I think, as, as Dr. Majet um, mentioned earlier about the child care, one thing to point out, and I'm not sure if we've said this tonight or if we said it this morning, um, the hotspots that you will be provided can go with the child to their child care um, if they're staying with an aunt, uncle, relative. Um, so if you have, if you get a hotspot, that can go with the child and their device to wherever they may be spending the day. So um, that's one option for parents that I know have to work. Um, the question was raised this morning, and I've seen it a couple of times in the chat. Um, can the students log on in the evening when the parent gets there? If we're doing live face-to-face -face virtual lessons, we would like for the child to be able to participate with the live lessons, but since some of them will be recorded lessons, um, it would possibly be a, a, an option for them to sign on in the evening and still get all of their work done to be counted present for the day. So that's another option as well, but there will be from time to time live virtual lessons with the teachers. Um, so it would be nice for the students to be able to participate in those if at all possible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question, Ms. Mills, what is the expectation for elementary level um, kids to participate during the time scheduled as parents must work during the school, the hours that school takes place? Okay, again, that's the same information. Um, okay. Just working with your child care provider or again, like I said, for the um, online pieces, some of the things will be recorded videos that they can do at a later time. All right. The next question is kind of similar, but it has a technology component to it. Uh, basically, um, uh, Hargrove is saying, if I'm not off until 4 p.m. and I can't log my student on until I get home, will that be counted? Uh, will my student be counted as absent that day? And so, Ms. Rogers, what you're saying is pretty much any time that they log on within that day they, and complete the assignments, they should be fine, correct? They can, yes, they can potentially log on later in the day and if they're able to complete their assignment, um, depending on how much they have to do if they're not logging on until the evening, um, it, you know, I, there's no way for me to say can they get it all done in just the evening hours um, to be com com counted completely present, that's something we'll have to look at on a case by case basis. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, and again, some of the lessons will be live virtual lessons that we would like for them to participate in during the day as well. Okay. Uh, and the next part of that question, Ms. Pearson, um, if someone has three children at home, uh, there's concerns about the 22 gigabytes of data uh, with the hotspot. Is there a way for families to receive more for each child? Or what if parents can't afford the additional internet service on their own? Okay, so the 22 gigabytes of data um, is that device typically can um, hold up to five devices, um, that hotspot can hold up to five devices connected to it. There are a couple of factors that play into that. If the, ch if the child is using it um, specifically for virtual instruction, um, then they may have a higher usage, but if they're using it for hybrid and virtual learning, then their usage may be a little bit lower. Um, there are other factors that may play um, come into play as it pertains to the hotspot if a child is um, if they're leaving the devices on. Um, there are a couple of troubleshooting things that you can do that can kind of extend the uh, monthly service for those devices as you're using them. Um, but we, what we would do is it would be a case-by-case -case basis because we know that um, the company tells us that five devices can, can connect. So it would probably be a monitor your usage. We would monitor your usage for a month and, to, and, and determine whether or not you would necessarily need to get an additional device for your household. Um, because it may seem like you're using a lot, but sometimes it may not be a lot of data um, depending upon what you're actually doing for your instruction. Okay, um, thank you. The next question is about dropping off at school in the mornings, the earliest that you can drop off your child in the morning for work parents. Again, I think that's gonna be a school by school um, situation. I know the high school, those students will be arriving a little bit earlier than at the elementary level. Um, but I think once we get the information from the survey and we've worked out all the bus routes and we can figure out the staggered schedule for bringing in buses, um, we can then work on the students that will be dropped off as car riders. So I would say that's kind of gonna be a school by school decision um, to make that um, call. Thank you. And Ms. Pearson, I think you already touched on this, how will the laptops be distributed. So you um, continue to gather that information from the survey and you'll get information out about that, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, 
another question, uh, and I believe we did answer it, but I do want to touch on it again. If parents opt for the virtual only model, are they locked into this for the entire school year or can they change to the hybrid model later in the year? And so I know that question has come up um, quite a bit. Can you just touch on it briefly again, Ms. Rogers? Yes, again, it's gonna be more difficult to go from the virtual to the hybrid. So if you choose the virtual model and wanna come back, that is gonna require us having to look at class sizes and bus routes and so forth. So that's gonna be much more difficult. We're asking that you try not to do that unless there's an extenuating circumstance. Um, but if you are under the hybrid model and you want to switch to all virtual, that will be an easy transition to make. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Ms. Johnson, uh, bus drivers responsible for cleaning the bus routes after completion. And we will talk about this more when we talk to faculty and staff tomorrow. Uh, but, but yes, and we'll go into details tomorrow as to what tools will be uh, utilized to make this a, a, an easy process, but to ensure that the buses are uh, clean. Um, uh, Ms. Lynch, uh, great comment. Nurse aid still requires the 40 clinical hands-on hours, and that is something that I know that uh, Ms. Rogers is going to be um, communicating with you and, and Dr. Thornhill and just looking at that, um, what the next steps will be uh, for that. Uh, Ms. Jones, she just wants to make sure if she has five kids that are all school age children, will all five be receiving a Chromebook? That is correct. Um, and Ms. Jones, but you would need to um, complete the survey for each individual child. Okay. And then, um, you know, and just having some concerns in general about having students that have upper respiratory uh, issues and they uh, really feel a little bit more comfortable with uh, virtual learning. Um, another question, Ms. Young, if a child tested positive for COVID-19, would the entire bus and classroom be placed on a 14-day quarantine? And would it be feasible for the child's temperature to be checked before getting on the bus? I um, mean, I know I touched on the, the piece with getting on the bus um, before getting on it. And, and trust me, that was the first thing that I thought about um, as we were going through this process. And I was like, oh, we can, and, you know, check them right there at the bus stop. Um, but that's when, like, some of the logic and things set in. And, and um, I'm thankful uh, for these wonderful people I work with that started to question me about that because um, if that child does have a fever at that point um, and there's no parent available, we can't just leave them there. Um, we are hoping, I think as Ms. Mallory and I think Ms. Rogers stated earlier, that some of the expectations with parents work with us. If your child is sick, keep your child home. This is, um, this is something that is, is new for all of us. This isn't your run of the mill cold. Um, so if your child has a fever, or they're experiencing some of the symptoms, work with us. Keep your child at home. We'll make sure the child gets the work. Um, we'll make sure the child gets the meal. Um, but it's not only for the safety of your child, but it's for the safety of everyone else's child. Um, so, so no, I do understand your concern there, but we will not be able um, to, to do that piece. Um, Ms. Mallory, briefly, if the child tested positive for COVID-19, if the child tests positive for COVID-19, um, then notification will be made to um, the families of the other students who may be required to self-quarantine for 14 days or, um, or whatever the guidance is from our epidemiologists and the CDC at the time that we enter um, or encounter that, I should say. And Dr. Mayer, if I may add um, something or throw something out that um, we have some concerns about from other parents would be, um, please parents, do not administer um, uh, fever reducing medication to your students or your children in an effort to make them feel better um, to be able to send them to school. Um, we're just asking you, please, please work with us on this. Um, if your child is coming down with symptoms of COVID-19, they're gonna be experiencing some other things other than a fever. So just trying to mask that um, will not pre um, be enough to enable them to continue to come to school. Uh, I know that we've had several parents who are really, really concerned about the fact that sometimes parents give them fever-reducing medication and then send them back to school. 
please work with us on this. Um, as Dr. Majette indicated, we're trying to do what is in the best interest of not only your child, but the other 1,500 that we're providing educational services for. Thank you, Dr. Majette. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Daniel, parents have the option to text or email the staff if the student's gonna be absent or tardy from the virtual classroom. Um, yes, we will continue to use the Remind app. That seemed to be very popular at the end of the year um, in the survey that we did a few weeks ago. Had a lot of positive feedback about the Remind app. So that is a way that um, parents can text um, or email the teachers. Um, I'm not sure that teachers are going to give out their personal email, um, text or cell phone numbers, but using the Remind app, you are able to text back and forth with that teacher. Okay. Um, I think we answered this earlier. Could a parent purchase their own Chromebook for their child? And my understanding is that they can, correct? Ms. Yes, Pearson? Ma'am. All right. Um, will all students and staff be required to have a negative COVID-19 test prior to participating in the hybrid model as some students and or staff may be asymptomatic? No, um, and I did um, put this in the chat box, Dr. Majette, as well. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, ma'am. It's further down. <laughs> Okay, um, the questions are rolling in. Yes, so I just want to yes. miss anybody. Okay. We're definitely right. getting more um, questions today, um, tonight, than we did this morning. Um, hey, it's good. It's we good. do have over 100 people on the line. So, hey, but um, it is not the requirement at this time um, based on um, information from CDC or the Virginia Department of Health or the Virginia Department of Education that we require. Um, our students or staff to obtain a negative um, COVID-19 testing test um, prior to coming to work or coming participating in the hybrid um, plan. Um, again, though, please keep in mind that Brunswick County local government has provided at, thus far at least two opportunities for COVID-19 testing and maybe more opportunities will be coming your way. Uh, we do publicize that information on our social media as well as our website. So um, utilize those to find out more about participating in um, future testings if you're interested for your family and encourage your friends and, and um, other people that you know to go get tested as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Michelle, right. also, also, if I may, really quickly, back to Ms. Young's question. I didn't want, because I didn't want to miss that part. Because um, I, I want to make sure that um, I'm clear in stating that, yes, you can purchase your own, but there are certain applications that we have added to our devices that um, are pertinent to some of the subscriptions that we have for our school division. So that is something that you may want to consider when you're thinking about purchasing your own. Um, is it going to be compatible for what the child needs for their instructional delivery? Okay, thank you. Um, whatever questions are not in the chat at this point, um, you got about 60 seconds to add any additional questions in the chat or in the text because we want to go ahead and get through these and then we're probably going to try to end in the next 15 minutes. So we want to make sure that we answer your questions. So um, take this next minute. If you have questions that have not been answered, um, please make sure that you enter them either in the chat below or send the text message and we're going to go ahead and go through the rest of these questions. Um, and if it's some, I'll read the question and just, if it has been answered, I will note that it has been answered. Uh, as a working parent, uh, will the children be required to access classes five days a week virtually from eight to three, or can it be accessed within the working parent schedules as long as the student's getting material? And Ms. Whitehead, uh, yes, that, that is correct. Um, um, just as long as the students are able to access that, the work. Um, do we have Ms. Jones? Do we have someone in place to have to support um, and provide resources for parents that uh, have more than four kids in school? And I remember Ms. Pearson mentioned doing monthly parent meetings. Yes, and um, as well as the ITRTs that are at the um, buildings, they can help as it pertains to instructional technology support. Okay, perfect. And then I know um, Mrs. Rogers had mentioned some parent links and some information as well. Um, how will the school communicate with all uh, BP, BCPS um, parents should a student contract, um, contact contract co um, COVID-19? And I know Ms. Mallory uh, at that point is going to go on the guidance of the Virginia Department of Health and will um, make contact, uh, appropriate contact from there. 
Um, Ms. Thomas is asking about if a student tests positive. Ms. Mallory, I believe you did cover that. And then uh, will the students, uh, individuals who are in contact with that student self-isolate? And I know you mentioned that you'll be following the uh, Department of Health guidance uh, from there. Um, this is from Ms. Tanner. The students who may struggle with certain subjects, how would teachers assist with their needs? Um, we may have covered it, but um, she wasn't necessarily sure. So Ms. Rogers, can you touch, that, touch on that one? Um, yes, at the elementary and middle school level, again, there is a remediation block that has been built into the schedule and that time can be used um, for additional support and remediation of students who may be struggling in certain areas. Um, and also throughout the day, um, I didn't state this previously, but the students will not be face to face or in front of a computer all the time. There may be time that they can get one on one assistance from teachers um, as needed during office hours and so forth. So there will be support for um, students who are struggling in various areas. Um, you, again, we'll need parents to help communicate that for, to the teachers to make sure that they're aware, especially for the younger students who may not be able to do that communication on their own. Okay, let's see. Um, where can we register for hotspots? Ms. Gutierrez, um, that's gonna come out with the survey that Ms. Pearson's gonna send out. Um, let's see, what else? Sorry, I kind of lost my place. Are tardies going to count for all grade levels? Ms. Rogers? Can you repeat that when I was reading a previous question up above? Okay, are, are tardies going to count for all grade levels? Yes, we will look at tardies, but again, that's a situation if you are logging in in the evening, um, it's going to be difficult to um, look at the tardy. So that's something that the administrative team may need to go back and look at again. Um, for that, as far as a virtual face-to-face -face lesson, live face-to-face -face lesson, um, we were considering tardies if, if students don't report on time to those, um, but that is something based on the number of questions that have come in from working parents and asking about logging in after hours that I think the admin team will need to go back and kind of um, have some more communication about that. Okay, let's see. Give me a second. <laughs> Uh, still more questions about screening before the students get on the bus. I know I had touched that one. Um, reference to virtual learning. Uh, virtual learning model. I think Ms. Pearson, you had indicated that the 22 gigabytes um, is sufficient for how many students or how many devices? That, the device will um, carry up to five, um, but as stated before, if there is an issue in which you feel that you're not going to have enough connectivity for your students, we would um, monitor your usage for at least one month to determine whether or not you would need an extra device, um, and then we can kind of do a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Uh, when can students expect to receive their class schedules for, for next year? Um, I think that's going to kind of kind of vary uh, a little bit, but of course, um, probably not long after we can um, get this plan finalized, get it to the board for their review and approval. Uh, and will there be a virtual open house? Ms. Rogers? Um, this is not something we have actually discussed in great detail yet, but um, yes, we will probably do some type of virtual open house at the beginning of the year. Um, the administrative team meets weekly um, we've been working on this plan, and so now we can start talking about the next steps once this plan is approved. Um, but yes, it will probably be um, a combination of virtual or, or somehow a staggered face-to-face. -face. We have to have conversation about that to make sure that we maintain the social distancing and the number of people in the building at one time. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Ms. Jones, three kids in Totero, one in the middle school, one in the high school. Um, can they have login information for the email passwords, information sent home via paper for easier tracking, Ms. Pearson? Yes, that is something that we plan to do with the distri distribution of the actual Chromebooks for each individual student. Um, but if you do have a child that could potentially be attending virtual summer school at this moment, then um, the information that we gave earlier would allow you to be able to contact those um, people to get that access. Okay. Um, the next two questions are pretty similar. Uh, just if a child has symptoms of COVID, 
while at school, um, contacting the parents. I know Ms. Mallory's touched on that a few times. And then students and faculties that faculty members that may have a parent that works directly with COVID-19 patients, what's the recommendations in regards to this, if it's a parent or household member, Ms. Mallory? Is it the same guidelines? Well, Dr. I mean, we don't have any recommendations at this point. Nothing's been provided to us um, mm -hmm. on parents who work directly to, with COVID-19 um, patients. Um, Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Ms. Gutierrez, uh, what high school students will be allowed in the building and what will be our schedules for both? And I believe you had covered the, the high school schedule, pretty much the uh, CTE school students and- um, The multiple disability students, um, the CTE and band are the ones who will be coming for face-to-face -face instruction on a daily basis and the schedule will be based on what day they have whether a or b day when they have the cte course the okay. uh, multiple disability students will be all four days okay thank you uh what will be the disciplinary disciplinary steps taken with students and or staff who are not or refuse to adhere to social distancing and health guidelines That's a great question, and we're going to be following our code of conduct. <laughs> that, that's one that we have had some conversation about, um, and so we are looking at following our code of conduct as far as um, the, it would be considered disruptive behavior if they're not following the guidelines and the things that they've been asked to do or um, defiance if we're asking them to do something that they refuse as far as social distancing goes. Okay. All right. Um, still more questions about the bus and checking at the bus stop. Um, and this is a great question uh, from Ms. Young. How comfortable are you all with this overall back to school plan? Uh, Ms. Young, I can tell you um, that, that I do feel comfortable with, with the plan um, because we not only, and I'll tell you on two levels, um, we, we're following um, the mitigation strategies, Department of Health, what they recommended, um, and I know that we have the latitude to look at this plan and really say, hey, we can bring everyone back. Um, but I'm just, I can't say that, and I don't want to sway anybody's decision or anything. Um, but I, I will say that I think with this, we give the option um, at a very small, slow, staggered pace um, for those with the social distancing and the proper mitigation strategies for those parents that are comfortable having their students come back to school on a very limited basis and a very structured basis. Um, with also giving that option for parents who are not comfortable to do the 100% virtual. I don't think this is a, um, as I've said earlier, uh, I don't think this is a one size fit all uh, type of thing. So we wanted to make sure that we had models that we felt comfortable with that students could still, those who wanna be educated in person can be educated in person safely, but with the understanding that those who are not comfortable would have that opportunity um, to, to opt out and do what's comfortable um, for them. Um, so, because it's your child and, and definitely um, you trust us, you entrust us with your child and their care every day. Um, so. Uh, ethically, I definitely wouldn't put out something that I wasn't comfortable uh, with at all. Um, so if I wasn't comfortable with it, I wouldn't present it to you. Um, the next question, uh, Ms. Lewis, we have students that are sick at school each year. Parents cannot be reached. Um, I, I think this may be more of like a staff question for tomorrow and how we need to handle it. But it's just saying, you know, kids are in clinics um, during the day, riding the bus home, even though they're sick. You know, how are we going to handle this? And these are going to be some things that we are going to have to work through as a faculty and staff to figure out how do we, how do we make this work. And also on the parent end, what we've been saying is it can't just be the school. So we need that parental support. We need all parents engaged, all hands on deck, um, because this is not our normal school year. Um, and this is, uh, again, something very different for all of us. So we need everyone involved to, to make this happen. 
Um, the next question, Ms. Young, if you all had students in school, would you feel comfortable sending your child to school? <laughs> I think so, I can answer that one. Okay. <laughs> um, I know for me, um, as a as a parent, um, I please don't think that I took it lightly sitting at the table and being a part of the team to make these decisions because I had to look at it from a parent perspective and an educator. Um, I know it's overwhelming and it's a great concern and um, we don't, this is not something from my son is a rising first grader. This is not something that I would want to have for him to have for his fundamental years. Um, but I am um, thankful that we I have the option to be able to choose virtual and or I mean or hybrid for him and um, just trying to educate him and make him as comfortable as possible to know what the school year may look like for him um, so that he's aware and he can understand that it may not be the same as what he's used to. But I definitely, um, and my husband as well, we don't want him to miss too much instructional time because our hope is that eventually we'll get back to some type of normalcy. All right. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. And I appreciate you jumping in because uh, it was most appropriate as you are a parent of a Brunswick County public school child. So um, the next question, I'm just kind of going down. Uh, Mr. Perrier, uh, good evening. Will the frequently asked questions and responses be posted for parents and guardians to, to view? Um, that was one of the things we did talk about this morning and this morning session. We've had quite a few questions. So once we're able to gather to gather all the questions from both calls today, um, then we will we do we'll uh, post some frequently asked questions and we've already started that that document already. Um, next question. Um, all right, Ms. Gutierrez, hybrid schedule for high school seniors. Hybrid schedule is going to be, the high school schedule um, is gonna be set for students nine through 12. So the schedule that you saw, regardless of grade level, is really just mostly based on whether or not you're in the multi -dis multiple disabilities classroom uh, and or uh, taking career and technical education classes. Let's see. Um, designated staff personnel who's responsible for responding to COVID-19 concerns. And then clarification, do you have designated staff who's responsible for um, the response to that? And Ms. Mallory? It would be our school nurses um, with the assistance of whatever school personnel who are working um, in the designated areas on, on, um, at the schools. Um, and then we make contact with the epidemiologists um, through the Department of Pupil Personnel Services. Okay, um, just a few other questions. You have an emergency or medical response plan for COVID-19, uh, Ms. Mallory. Um, so Dr. Majet, um, I want a little bit more clarification on that. I'm taking it that they wanna know that if an emergency arises, um, the guidance yes. right now is that we call EMS. So we'll be notifying the parent but um, at the same time, we're making notification to EMS. If your kid is displaying um, that severe of symptoms for COVID-19 um, and having some significant respiratory issues, um, we're, we're not going to be able to wait for you to get there. We're going to call for EMS to come and pick your child up and transport them to the hospital. Okay, thank you. All right, these are the last few questions. Um, Ms. Rogers, can you just pull on the screen the B day schedule for the high school? Ms. Pearson, can you pull it up? And just all they want is, is it to be shown. All right, the next question um, if I purchase a temperature gauge for my grandchild to take the temperature across the head each day, um, if a pre K student purchases a N95 breathable mask, will he or she? keep the mask on except for eating? And I would say yes. Okay. Uh, next question. Well, it was a comment from a parent. This has been very informative. Thank you. No, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Um, what if your child needs to ride two buses, one from home and one from daycare? And 
Ms. Pearson, you probably can answer this because this is part of the survey that's going to come out. Yes. Um, so the survey that will come out, it will give you two options. Um, one, to choose either the hybrid plan or the virtual, and then depending upon which plan, it will um, give you another series of questions. And some of the questions um, are pick up and drop off location uh, with address for your child. Okay. Um, and middle school, Dr. Carter, Mrs. Rogers for the middle school. Well, virtual learning is, is this an all day virtual assignment with certain times for each subject like a regular school day? Yes, that is the way it's set up that there will be certain times for each um, class that they take. So they'll sign into each class at a given time to complete those assignments. But for virtual days where the teacher is teaching face to face as a hybrid, um, they can do it in any order that they want because the teacher will not be there for face to face virtual. Okay. Awesome. All right. And the, uh, we got another note. Thanks for the information that's given out tonight. Have another question. Um, Ms. Erica is listening from work and wants to know if consideration has been given to pre-K to third at one school, fourth grade at another school, fifth grade at another school to increase additional educational time. And I could say I believe that we have not considered that. We still have to do the social distancing and um, the transportation would probably be an issue as well um, because we still have to have the space to spread these students out across, um, across the facility. Um, so last pieces, we got a few comments and questions. Uh, LTC, great job for all your due diligence and protecting the staff and safety of our most treasured assets. Thank you. And from Hargrove, thanks in this unknown time. No one has all the answers, so we do thank you for your time. And parents and guardians, um, we thank you for your time tonight. Um, we got another comment. Thank you all, very informative. Um, again, um, I thank you to this wonderful panel. They have been on this call with us twice today, and I do appreciate it. Um, this crew here, along with um, we have several teachers throughout the division and staff members who have worked on this task force to get this, um, to get everything together for you all tonight. Um, again, we appreciate the questions, the feedback. It keeps us on our toes. You definitely out outdid the 11 o'clock group. <laughs> we thought they had a lot of questions and feedback. You definitely did it and, and you, uh, you got us working, but it's good because it gives us this opportunity to now take this plan back and let's start tweaking and making some further revisions um, from there because we wanna uh, carefully vet this and look at, at all angles uh, prior to um, presenting to our school board on Monday because they do have a, um, a, they have a big job to do and looking at these plans and uh, making a determination as to what direction we will go. So um, again, your feedback will make the adjustments as necessary. Um, we do aim to provide a comprehensive plan that reflects your input. Um, and just understand that in designing this, um, of course, we wanna make sure that we have uh, appropriate educational outcomes for students. But in these unprecedented times, the safety of your, ki your students and to keep them healthy and safe um, really is the number one priority in this. Um, so again, we appreciate your flexibility. Um, we appreciate you understand that this is fluid. No, we don't have all the answers. Uh, COVID-19 is new for all of us. Um, once Ms. Pearson, are you going to drop it in the chat or are you just gonna be online, the survey? I can drop it in the chat. Okay. And does do any of our esteemed panelists have anything else that they'd like to share uh, for the good of the group? I think Ms. Mallory does. I know you do. Go ahead and share it. <laughs> <I'm gonna stop. laughs> Only because I wait. <laughs> I just sent Ms. Um, Dr. Magetta a note. Um, this came up in the, the session this morning, and I wanted to make sure that we got it on record for our evening session. Um, please note that at the present time, there are no exceptions to immunizations. So um, if you have children that are um, going to be entering school for the first time, you need to go ahead and schedule your physical examinations and um, make sure that you um, 
can get your immunizations done, as well as those students who are, I want to say 11 years old is now the guidance for the Tdap. Um, and so making sure that they get their Tdap shots um, for entrance into school. Know that whether your child is participating in virtual or the hybrid plan, they have to be properly immunized as we have to report to the state on every child that's in our school system. So um, someone did ask, does it apply to kids who are gonna be participating solely virtually? Uh, it is a part of the enrollment process and you need to make sure that um, you're meeting all the um, enrollment guidelines um, because we won't be able to enroll them or give them a schedule. I thank you, Dr. Majette. Thank you, Ms. Mallory. Ms. Pearson, what's the deadline for the survey? The deadline for the survey is Monday, June 3rd, July 13th, 2020 at 8 p.m., 8 a.m., I, I apologize. Let me say that again. Monday, it's been a long day. Monday, July 13th, 2020 at 8 o'clock a.m. <laughs> Thank you. All right, steam panelists, anything else? And I am posting the survey link now um, in the chat for the English and as well as our Spanish version. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna share one last comment and then I'm gonna say thank you all and good night. Um, this is definitely past my bedtime, I'm early bird. So this, uh, Miss Margaret Shepherson, she says she's very sa um, satisfied with Joel coming back to school. Thank you for ca taking care of your little, our little ones and God bless. And I send that out to this team, this entire team of panelists. And um, I know we have uh, several teachers and uh, everyone that's been, and board members, everyone that's been working on this to make sure that this plan uh, is one that's gonna provide the best education for our students uh, while keeping them safe during these times. So again, thank you all. And um, TDAP, is that required for seventh graders, Mallory, or just sixth grade? It's a, it's a sixth, it was a sixth grade, I should say, um, immunization Dr. Jack, but it's based on the child's age. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. I have one last question to slip in, but with that being said, you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. And um, we'll have more information coming soon. Thank you. Good night. I'll stay on for a little bit longer in the event that anyone is still um, trying to grab the survey link.